So it's the last chapter, the last lecture, chapter four. Uh, and this is going to be about K server. K server on trees. Okay, so uh, let me remind you the, the problem. So we have X, uh, let's say finite metric space. M. And at each time step, there is we receive a, a set request, which in this case is a singleton. Okay, so request at time t is simply some rt in x. Okay, so it's just one element of the of the set which is requested. And what you're controlling, instead of controlling a single agent that is moving, as we have been doing so far, you're controlling a fleet. Okay, you have k agents. So now what you what you have is that uh, one maintains a random a random set row t in. Uh, which is a subset of x, such that the size of rho t is k, and rt, the request, is in rho t. Okay, this is, uh, this is a problem. You have to, every time step, you should have a, a set, rho t, it can be random, it's of size k, you have k uh, elements, and you need that the request is in the set. So this is, this is a problem. And the question, so now you have a, a movement, you pay a movement to move uh, from rho t to uh, rho t plus one. Okay, so the movement is, uh, is the smallest movement to match uh, rho t minus one to rho t. Right, so if there is a, a single element that is moving, if there is just a single server that is moving, then the movement is just the movement that this server is doing. If you were for some stupid reason moving many servers, then it's just the best matching between those two configurations. Okay. And just as we have been discussing so far, we're interested in competitive ratio. So if we want to say that at the end of the day, we didn't move much more than the best we could have done in hindsight to satisfy all of those requirements. Uh, and the, the theorem that we're going to see today, the theorem is going to be an O of D times log K, where D is going to be the depth, competitive fractional algorithm, and, and this is a term that I, I, has not been used so far in the lecture, and I will explain what it means, on trees. Yeah, so, so, so it's the other way around. You get the request and then you choose the set. You know, it's really, uh, it's really like, like, like this. You have, uh, you have locations, right? This is your metric space. And maybe you're sitting here and here. Okay, you have two servers. And now, this location is requested. This is RT. Right? And, and, uh, and this, this two were rho T minus one. So now you have to move one of those two over there. Maybe you move this one. What is random is, uh, you know, maybe I'm going to choose which one of the two I move at random. I'm going to say I move this one with rho T half, or I move this one with rho T half. It is random, but this constraint has to be true almost surely. So you're moving at most one server at each time step? There is no point in moving more than one server. If you wanted, you could move more than one server, but the cost is higher. Yeah, the cost is just higher for no reason. You can always defer this type of movement to when it's really necessary. Okay. So just to, to clarify an, an application of this, 
and I think I mentioned it already in the first lecture, but let me remind you, it's uh, caching, okay, dynamic caching. So again, here, the idea is that you have a, a cache of size k, a universe of n pages, and you know, whenever a page is requested, uh, if it's not in your cache, you have to fetch it in your cache. In your cache, okay? You have, you have to bring it in your cache, uh, and you pay a cost of one, say. But more generally, you, you know, the pages could have a weight. Certain pages are more expensive to bring into your cache, okay? So uniform of, universe of n pages with weights, let's say. With weights. W1, etc., up to Wn. Okay, so cost of fetching page i is Wi. Okay, so, so certain pages are just more expensive to fetch in your cache. Okay, so those pages, once they are in your cache, maybe you should be more reluctant to remove them. Okay, so that's the whole point of, of the k-server problem is that sometimes, you know, when you have a server which is on, say, a very distant island, maybe it's going to take more convincing to you, you should be more reluctant to move out this server. Because if there is again a request over there, you're going to pay this very big distance. So you might want to maintain it over there. Okay, and, and again, this is a, 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 a real application and what you want to do is to be competitive with respect to the best you could have done in uh, in hindsight. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So in this case, the cost of moving is not moving, it's just leaving one. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So this is like a, a, a one-sided movement. And, and how is it different from the facility location problem in that case, or uh, From the facility location problem. Yes. You mean uh, the online version, or? Right, yeah, I mean, not the, off the offline version. Or so here, um, the offline problem is not difficult, right? The offline problem is just a dynamic program. So, so there, is no, there is no depth in a sense to the offline problem. Like if you were given the whole sequence of requests in advance, it's very easy to compute what is the optimum. If you know it won't appear again, then you can move it out uh, very easily. Yeah. And so this would be, so the corresponding example here is just a star with weights, right? This is just this example that we have done for MTS and that we're going to redo now for okay, KSO. Yeah? Please. The data subversion of your attention is very right? So uh, it depends if you have. Uh, so, so you can have, you can have, like, it depends where is the size. So this is size of page. You can also have size of cache. So if size of cache, then yes, it is hard. Exactly. Yeah. 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 If if the cache has a size, then it's different. Here it's the pages which have a size. Very different. Okay. And yeah. So so there is a, 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 a weighted case server problem where the servers. They have weight themselves. So ser certain servers, they are, you know, it, it, uh, a little movement is more expensive for them than other servers. Mm -hmm. This is a much more difficult problem. Um, okay, so this is a tree of depth one, but now you could imagine a multi-scale cache, right? Which is, as far as I understand, what you really have in computers, right? So it's not only one cache, but in fact, there are many levels of cache, you know, whether they are deeper or not. And then it's exactly a tree problem. Okay, now it becomes exactly a tree problem. So what I'm going to tell you today is a way to solve dynamically this type of, of questions. Okay, good. So that's all I'm going to say about uh, applications. So now I will tell you what I meant by this fractional. Okay, 
case. So uh, one fractional algorithms. Okay, so a fractional algorithm uh, here. If I want to maintain a distribution of a set of size k, this is a very high dimensional object. This is an object of dimension n to the k. Okay, so a distribution uh, on sets, on, on uh, configurations, is very high dimensional. It's of size n to the k. Okay, so we don't like to manipulate objects like that, neither in practice nor in theory. Okay, it becomes very hard to understand wh wh what's happening. So instead, what we're going to do is that instead of working with the entire distribution, we're only going to work with its first moment. So fractional algorithm only maintain the first moment of such a distribution. First moment of such a distribution. And the first moment, this is just of size n. Size n object. Okay, which is what we like. Just like before, the distribution of a single element, this is an object of size n. Is yeah. the first moment the, uh, the mean of how many times some elements on the set? Exactly. So I'm going to write it down. That's exactly what it is. So a distribution, let's say rho t of a set A, this is the probability that rho t is equal to A, right? For any set A in X. Okay, and say of, of size K. So this is this very high dimensional object that we don't want to deal with. Instead, what we're going to deal with is uh, ZT, which is going to be the first moment, uh, not ZT of A. So let me think of, let me identify rho t. Now let's think of it as an element in 0, 1 to the n. OK, so this is the same thing as, as a set. OK, it just tells me whether I have a server in that location or not. OK, so such that the sum of the rho t, let's say i, for i equals 1 to and this is equal to k. Okay, let me now use this notation. Then zt is going to be nothing but the expectation under new t of rho t. Okay, or in other words, uh, zt, zti, this is just the probability that. Uh, Rho t contains i in the set notation. This is in set notation. Vector notation. No, no, no. Z is not the same as the request. Z, Z, it's uh, Z, it's this. Okay. So in particular, okay. In particular. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's amazing that this only comes up now after you know almost six hours of lectures. Yes. Uh, sorry for my handwriting. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, Zt at. Okay. Sorry. I can't do it. Uh, yeah. Rt. This is one. So Z, I want you to think of it as a fractional mass. This is a fractional amount of servers that there is at location I. 
Okay, or in other words, the probability is that there would be a, a server at location i. So what we're going to manipulate is only z t. Yes. So what, what you're saying is that um, we don't care about the joint distribution. Very good. So it's not that I don't care. I, I care about it very much. Uh, when 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 I'm going to do an actual randomized algorithm, I need to specify the full distribution. So there is a question. It's not at all obvious that a fractional algorithm can be rounded into a real algorithm. Okay. And I'm, I'm just going to point out the difficulty and not talk about it. Okay, we don't have time, and, uh, but so, um, so, it, so no, I care about the correlation, but the beauty is that, okay, maybe let me tell you the beauty. So the theorem, so this is due to uh, Bensal, Binder, Madri, and now in their stock 11 paper, is that if X, if the metric space X is an HST, okay, so now this is the first time that we really need this notion. So again, an HST, this is a hierarchically separated tree. This is a tree metric where the weights are decreasing exponentially. Okay, so it's a very special type of trees. So if X is an HST, um, one can round on nine a fractional solution. into a randomized algorithm. at a constant factor cost. Okay. So, and maybe I should make it clear, what is the cost on, uh, on the fractional solution? The cost on the fractional solution is just the Wasserstein distance. Okay, so note, cost of fractional algorithm is by definition the Wasserstein norm of uh, zt minus zt minus 1. Okay. So this is a cost, and it's not, again, not, this is not at all obvious. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove that you can do this for the case of a uniform space, okay, where all the distances are 1 just so that you get a feeling for what's happening. But even the case of a weighted star is non-trivial. So, so just to interpret what you're saying, yes. is like, uh, you're saying essentially that the coupling between one time step and the other and the next one is done optimally because you're taking the time distance. Very good. But the coupling within one time step is so much given by this theorem. So, You cannot interpret this as a coupling because those things are not probability distribution. They have total mass k. Uh, yes. So that's the difficulty. Uh, right. Notice, OK, maybe here is a good uh, uh, thing to point out. Notice we didn't worry about this at all last lecture when we were talking about metrical task systems. We didn't worry about all what's the difference between maintaining a probability distribution or maintaining a random state. And the reason why we didn't worry about it is in the case of a real probability distribution, by definition, the Wasserstein distance is the optimal coupling. So you could just obtain a randomized algorithm by doing the, the optimal coupling. There was no problem here. Uh, there. Here there is a problem because this definition doesn't correspond to anything probabilistic between zt and zt minus 1 because these are not measures, these are things that sum to k. Okay, so that's, that's the difficulty. So let me give you an example. So 
what's, what's the difficulty? So imagine, so I'm going to give you a very concrete example so that uh, we're on the same page. So let's say we have a 4, so n is going to be equal to 4, and k is going to be equal to 2. Okay, so I have a four state uh, problem and I have two servers. And I have those two locations, A and B, they are just, they have weight one. And then I have location C and D, which are super far. Okay, this is location C and D. And this is some, uh, some value much bigger than one. Okay, some D much bigger than one. Okay, so th these are, this is my metric space. And now say rho t minus 1, it's AB with 31 half, or uh, CD with 31 half. Okay, so ZT minus 1 is just 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. One half. Okay, so this is my fractional mass. I have a, a, a fractional mass of server of one half of lo at location A, uh, one half at location B, C, and D. Okay, and the way it's realized somehow, you know, the algorithm is currently in some state, and the state I look at it and I realize that with 40 a half, I, I have two servers at A, B, and with 40 a half, I have uh, two servers at C, D. Then I claim that I'm in trouble. So imagine that now I want to get my algorithm. So again, what are we going to do, by the way? We're just going to run mirror descent on the fractional mass. Okay, that's all we're going to do. So let's say I run mirror descent, and now zt should be 0, 1, 1 half, 1 half. And what's going on? This is good, yeah. Okay, let's say I want to get to this configuration. But I, I'm in lots, lots of trouble because, you know, now I need to be in location B with 31. So you see, if I was in, in, in row T minus 1, uh, now I need to send A to either location C or D. So here, okay, what is the Wasserstein distance? The Wasserstein distance is 1 half. I just need to move this mass one half from location A to B. But moving from rho t minus one to a valid rho t distributed according to zt has cost at least d. There is no other way. If I, was, if I was in this location, I need to move A to either C or D. And if I was in this location, I need to move one of those two to location B. So you cannot always, it's just not true, it's just not true that this represents some kind of coupling. So you really need to think about how things are happening online, yes? Just to be sure. Yeah. Very good, very good, very good. Yes, yes, you're correct. Uh, so this is not a great example. You're correct. In the sense that uh, this is not a state that is going to be visited by a K-server algorithm. But in fact, that as you will see, we're going to do a continuous time analysis. Okay, just as before, it's much nicer. And as the algorithm is moving, it could visit locations like this. Okay, so during, during the course of the algorithm, it may be that you end up here, and then you know our, our analysis will say something about how it moves from here to here, and I'm <coughs> saying that this, you cannot round this analysis. Yeah. Okay, but if, it were, if we were in a uniform space, this wouldn't be a problem. So note, in a uniform space, Things are easy. So what do I mean? Let me just try to be slightly 
more concrete without getting into too much details. So imagine uh, zt <coughs> is equal to zt minus 1. And then I just want to add mass, fractional mass at location i and remove fractional mass at location j. OK, I only need to understand how to do such basic moves. I want to increase a little bit the probability that I have a server at location i and decrease a little bit the probability that I have a server at location j. OK, so I have i here and j is there. And I want to reduce by epsilon here, and I want to increase by epsilon there. So what am I going to do? In the randomized solution, so now I need to think about the randomized solution. The, the randomized solution is a distribution of a configuration. So if um, in the randomized solution, for rho t minus 1, There is epsilon probability, there is at least an epsilon probability that i and j appear together. Uh, uh, sorry, that i and j, that's not what I meant. That j, I meant that j appears without i. OK, so again, I, I have a solution of size k, a random solution. And let's say that in this random solution, there is some probability epsilon that the, the configuration that I get, it contains j, but it doesn't contain i. Then I can just, for those configurations, I can replace j by i. I can actually move j to i. This is going to cost me the distance between i and j, which is the same thing as this Wasserstein distance. So if this happens, I'm good. There is no problem. Then, then easy. OK, I can actually do the modification in the randomized solution. And if it's not the case, if it is not the case, OK, so there is some, there is some epsilon prime probability that i and j appear together. What I'm going to do is that I'm just going to look at another set where they don't appear. Okay. And epsilon prime proba that neither i nor j appear. OK, so the picture is that I have i and j, and maybe I have two other points, you know, i prime and j prime. So this is i and j. So I have some epsilon mass of configuration which contains both i and j, and I have some epsilon mass of configuration which contains neither i nor j. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to swap things. So when i and j appears, I'm going to replace, so here I replace j by, say, i prime. So instead of having j up here, I will have i prime up here. And so now the, the probability of, of i prime has gone up, okay, uh, which I don't want. So in this one, I'm going to replace i prime by i. And the point here is, is it's very important that it's a uniform space because these two islands, they could be very, very far away from each other. So you know, I'm justifying a move between i and j by using points which could be very, very far away, which is exactly what was happening in this example. But in the uniform space, it's fine. Okay. So the point here was not necessarily for you to completely follow and understand everything that I said. It's, it's more to point to you to some of the difficulties of what's going on here. And that in the uniform case, it's easy, and in general, it's harder. But this, you can really make precise what I just wrote here. OK, so now that's it. Now we're going to follow on fraction. We're going to focus on fractional. Okay. Now we focus on fractional. The way our uh, uh, solutions is evaluated is through the Wasserstein distance. And we all agree this is the problem. Okay. 
So now let me just uh, briefly explain what, how to apply mirror descent, because it's not obvious there is no cost right now. So is the theorem that the Jesse race does not prove when you have a diagram? No, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But th people's thinking is that this is something we will think about once we have an algorithm for the fractional version on general metric spaces. Since we don't even know that, uh, yeah. I think the belief in this field is that it should be fine. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. OK, so mirror descent setting. OK, so again, I have this. I'm, I'm going to maintain this z, which is, let's write it as delta nk. So this is a set of, of points. Uh, so this is a set of points z in R plus N, such that the sum of the ZI is K, and all the ZIs are smaller than one. Okay, so you already see that I'm, I'm having one more Lagrangian term compared to before. Okay, so before we, we just have the sum of the ZI was one, here we have another one which is, uh, the ZIs, they cannot be, uh, bigger than one. Okay, it's not actually very important. Uh, we'll see. So, so to apply mirror descent, we want a cost. Okay, we want to think of a cost function. If you want to think of a cost function, it's actually nicer to think in terms of anti-servers. Instead of thinking you have to have a server here, you can think I really don't want a non-server there. Okay. So consider x, which is 1 minus z. Okay, so this is a, a missing, missing mass. Okay, so x at location i represents a missing mass. So if I have zero at location i in x, it means there is no mass missing, so I have a server z. And now the cost in terms of x is very nice. So cost in terms of x is simply the linear function Infinity times ER. Okay, so if I have a request at location R, I cannot have any mass missing at location R. If I have a little bit of mass missing at location R, it means I don't have a full server there. I didn't satisfy the request. Okay, so this is the cost that we're going to look at. And just as before, so this is, a, you know, in discrete time, the one, one step cost. Instead of doing the discrete time analysis, we're going to do the continuous time analysis. So I'm just going to present to you this, this cost continuously until you empty out the location. Okay, so in continuous time, a request at location R. corresponds to a cost pass C of T, which is just ER. Okay? I just, you know, as long as you have some, miss, some, some value of X which is non-zero, I punish you. Okay, you get the cost, you get the cost, you get the cost. And I'm just gonna punish you until you actually leave out. Okay, corresponds to a cost pass CT equals R. So, yeah. So, what do you mean 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, I mean what I wrote. <laughs> so, uh, just that, uh, um, you know, x in a product between x and infinity er, that's either zero if uh, x at location r is zero, and it's infinity otherwise. Okay, so, so this exactly tells you that you want to be at a point where there is zero missing mass at location r, otherwise you're infinitely uh, punished. Okay? But indeed, it's not very uh, pleasant to work with those infinities, so instead we work with this continuous time thing, you know, where I push with force one until you leave out. Say again? Like, will, will this make it feasible? Okay, very good. It, it's, uh, yeah, very good. Uh, it's not obvious. It is true, but not obvious. <laughs> uh, if you want, it has to be true for the mirror descent uh, framework because for mirror descent to be competitive, say, for metrical task system, it has to be that at some point you get so much punishment for being in this location that you actually leave out. Uh, but yeah, it's not obvious and, and I'm gonna, no, it's really not obvious. So I'm, I'm gonna explain. Okay. So more, let's say I will add morally, uh, starting from fractional configuration Z and request R. We run mirror descent and configuration is X, okay? And fra uh, negative fractional, right? Configuration X and request R. We run mirror descent on X with cost C of T equals ER until x at location r at time t is zero. In test, we have a server there. Okay, and as Cristobal was uh, pointing out, it's not at all obvious that, at, that uh, in finite time you get to this. Okay, but I, I will explain that in a second. So really, the, the equation is going to be, you know, uh, x, so k is going to be something like, uh, example of, of something like this, would be you take k to be all the x in uh, r plus n, such that the sum of the xi is equal to n minus k, for i equals 1 to k, and xi, uh, is smaller than one. So, so, that's, yeah. so the way it works is that you get a request and then you just move in time to the request. It's not that R depends on Very good. T. It's not like I'm moving my request. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can think I'm, I'm continuously moving the fractional uh, algorithm. And then what the randomized algorithm is doing, it's a bit harder to imagine, but it's, it's going to jump from time to time. It's going to do discrete jump in time to mimic the Wasserstein distance in expectation. Okay, and here I want to uh, make something a bit more precise. I wrote this ZI less than one. It was not so important, in fact. Okay, the fact that ZI is less than one. If you want to accumulate servers at one location, sure. You're welcome to do it, okay? What was really important is that you cannot have negative servers. Similarly here, it doesn't matter R plus, you know? If you want to have minus three server, minus three non-servers non somewhere, fine, you can do that, okay? It just means you have plus three servers there, or plus four. Uh, so what really matters is this xi smaller than one. It just means that you cannot have negative servers. Yes, please. 
Yeah. Very good. So this corresponds to one discrete time. So this was uh, for request. So this is configuration from satisfying last request. Okay, so you had some last requests, you were in some configuration. Now you get a new request. And now I'm going to go on to satisfy this request. I'm going to do something in continuous time for a long time. Okay, but, but during that time, you know, I mean, uh, during that time, I'm not getting new requests. I'm just, the algorithm is running. It's just the algorithm which is running to decide how to satisfy this one new request. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Exactly, so I'm gonna, so there is some velocity, I'm gonna travel some distance, and this is exactly the amount that I pay. Yeah, yeah? exactly. Uh, the speed of the cost is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, yes, yeah, the speed of the cost. Uh, so we're not worried like how much time. It's no, we, finite, we're, so it's okay. Yeah, we're not worried how much time, yeah. It's finite, so it's okay, and as we said, it's not obvious it's finite, uh, but, but it will be fine. Okay, so that's, that's the mirror descent setting. Okay, so now let me, uh, you know, kill two birds with one stone. A just, I'm gonna explain this, and at the same time, why can we hope to get log k uh, competitive ratio and not log n? Okay, so now, where is log k? instead of log n coming from. And <coughs> what's up uh, with <coughs> reaching zero <coughs> in finite time? So we're going to deal with both uh, at the same time. Work. On the other side. It's the other side. Okay, so. from k plus epsilon servers to k servers. Okay, so this is a general thing in online algorithms and, and I mean in math and particularly in general. So this, you know, you can view k server as a metrical task system problem. Okay, it's just a particular instance where, you know, just like it's a particular instance of online selection. And, and we have seen that for those general problems, you get log of the size of the metric space. So what you need, if you want to beat those very general results, is you, you want to leverage some structural property of your problem. So there needs to be somewhere a structure theorem that tells you that the problem has a certain combinatorial flavor which makes it special and that you can do something different. Where is this gonna appear? Remember, where is this log n coming from? This was coming from uh, the fact that in the entropy we were doing x x i plus delta log x i plus delta, and that we were using a delta which was like one over n. And the, and and this was important. This was the Lipschitz constant. Okay, so the Lipschitz constant was coming from this extra exploration, which which had to deal with the speed at which we were escaping things. And this delta was important to be one over n because we had something like, you remember, delta times the cost. And we said this is like n times the service cost of the algorithm. And n delta. Okay? So this fact that you get n delta times the cost 
is what's the reason why you got one over delta? Uh, one over n. Now notice from for us now the cost they are very special. They are of size one. Okay, there is just one entry which is non-zero. So maybe you can hope that this you know is, is gonna be only okay, it's not exactly true, but this there would be no n maybe. But again, there is something else that's going to prevent you from having delta too small. Okay, so we're, we're, we're going to see that just now. Yes? Is that the Higgs number problem is basically a fun case of the... the yes. Uh, you have to maintain the Higgs server, so actually if we want to the problem in the microbiotic system, we have like n to the... Like yeah, n to the k. Yeah, exactly. So if you... Yeah, so... If you just apply pure metrical task system result, the competitive ratio, you get a result, and the competitive ratio you get is k log n. So we are exactly asking for an exponential improvement over those general results. But this is really a, st a stupid way to see it, uh, but, but yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, so here is the idea, to leverage the structure and, and do something. The point is, I'm not going to stop at zero. I'm not going to stop when I have zero servers. I'm going to stop so that I don't have this issue, and I can just say delta c is really like x dot c. So what this means is that I'm going to stop when I reach delta. OK, so idea. Stop when x at the requested location at time t is equal to delta. So, of course, this is a problem. We said, you know, if you do that, uh, then you have missing mass delta. You don't really have a full server there. Well, but this formula, z is equal to 1 minus x, I can choose any formula. You know, z can be any, any formula of x. It doesn't have to be 1 minus x. So, z equals 1 minus x does not have a, f a server at r, but z equals 1 minus x over 1 minus delta does. Right? I can just rescale things. If I have missing mass delta, but instead my formula to go to fractional servers is z is 1 minus x over 1 minus delta, then when x reaches delta, z reaches 1. And I'm very happy. Of course, <coughs> I'm paying something. I mean, they, you know, this cannot come for free. The problem is what is going to be the sum for i equals 1 to n of the zi? Okay, so the sum of the 1 minus xi is k. So now this is k over 1 minus delta, which is basically like k plus k delta. So I have a little bit more fractional mass than k. Instead of having k servers, I have k plus a little bit. This can be dramatic because with k, like there are instances where with k plus one servers, I'm paying zero, whereas any algorithm with k server is paying infinity. You know, imagine if I just have uh, so these are k plus one points. I can cover all of them with k plus one servers, so I never pay. But with k servers, maybe I have to move all the time. Okay, so this little addition is not at all clear that you know you can you can uh, it's justified because now you have to round k plus epsilon servers to k servers. But here is the lemma. lemma. K plus epsilon fractional servers can be rounded, I mean rounded uh, in quotes, online to k servers at a multiplicative cost of 1 over 1 minus epsilon. Okay, so when epsilon get, goes to 1, the cost of rounding k plus epsilon to k goes to infinity. But if epsilon is 0.1, this is some bounded cost, uh, 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 
uh, increase. Okay, so this will imply that we can take delta of order one over k in this formulation. Okay, and in fact, in the multiscale entropy, it will say that we can take delta to be one over k. So let me prove uh, this. So the proof is again, we can apply any transformation that we want. So proof, take Z, which has uh, K plus epsilon mass. And now the K mass solution, I define it to be some sigma of Z. Well, sigma is going to be some map, so it's going to be, which applies entry-wise. Sigma of Z1, sigma of Z2, up to sigma of Zn. Okay, so I'm just going to apply a transformation coordinate-wise to those Zs. And the transformation that I'm going to apply will be such that sigma of Z will have mass K, and sigma is a Lipschitz map. Okay, such that Sigma is 1 over 1 minus epsilon Lipschitz. So Lipschitz in, in R, okay? Sigma is from the real line to the real line. And uh, the sum for i equals 1 to n of sigma of the i is going to be smaller than k. Okay, I'm just going to find, it's, it's going to be very simple. I'm just going to find a, a real valued map, okay, from R to R. I will just draw the graph. It's going to be 1 over 1 minus flip sheets, and it's going to have the properties that if I have a vector z which has mass k plus epsilon, then when I apply this map coordinate wise, I get an answer which is at most k. But we also need that sigma of 1 in 1. I, and, yes, yes, absolutely. And sigma of 1. Uh, sigma of one is one. Yes, very good. Thank you. I also need sigma of one is one. Yes. So that if I have a server in the K plus epsilon one, I also have a server in the K. So the map is just this. Um, so from zero to epsilon is just zero. And then at one, you know, as Rosé was saying, I need to get to 1. So I'm just going to get there linearly. Okay, so this slope is 1 over 1 minus epsilon, right? I get from, from uh, 0 to 1 in distance 1 minus epsilon. Okay, and then it continues. It's 0, and then it goes up, 0, and then it goes up. Okay, so this is my, my function sigma. That's a proof. Okay. Okay, I will let you stare at it for just one minute. <laughs> this is just, if you want, it's, it's just saying that in this k plus epsilon version of the problem, as long as I have epsilon, like less than epsilon server, I act as if I didn't have any servers. And then when I start to go above epsilon servers, then I say, okay, maybe, maybe you meant it for real to have a server there. So, you know, I start to increase. Until when you say, I should have one, I actually have one. Okay. That's, that's all this is doing. Okay, so now, uh, let's just see how this works uh, for the weighted star. Okay, let's combine all of these things and, and do the weighted star. And then I will, it seems like <coughs> I won't have much time to talk about the trees. Okay, so. Uh, one, two, three, four. 
So wait it's tough. So the weighted star, I'm just going to take again what is k, k is all the x, such that the sum of the xi is n minus k, and uh, the xi's are smaller than 1. And I'm just going to use the weighted entropy. Phi of x is going to be uh, the sum of xi log xi, and, uh, and w1. And here I don't need to shift by delta. Because, in fact, uh, no location is going to go below, below delta. Okay, so the dynamics will ensure that xi is always bigger than delta for any location i. Okay, remember, uh, this is a missing mass. So when I have, I have a certain configuration, and I have some location i, so now I have to have a server here. So I'm applying a force, right? So the, the, the mass is diminishing here. And you already know the dynamics of this thing, right? We, we've done it now several times. So you already know that when I push here, this is going down, and all the other locations are going up. So if I stop when I reach delta, I never go below delta. Because now, then I will push somewhere else, and this will just go up. Maybe I come back, I push here. So I will always be bigger than delta. So phi, in fact, will be, uh, will be log 1 over delta Lipschitz. And we know we can take uh, Delta to be like one over k. Okay. So now, what, what does it mean exactly? So now I get that the service cost. What is the service cost? The service cost is totally virtual. It's just a trick that we're going to use to monitor the movement. There is no real service cost, but there is a virtual service cost, which is I'm, I'm pushing this cost. Okay. So the service cost is upper bounded by, uh, you know, um, let's say the Lipschitz constant, so log k times the movement cost of opt. Okay, opt, so ST, the, the service, the virtual service cost of opt is zero, note. Right, because opt, when there is a request, it just moves there immediately. So it never suffers this virtual service cost. Right. What, what is the service cost? Let me just say it again. This is the integral of um, this is the integral of x at the location r of t dt. Okay, this is some quantity. It doesn't mean anything for the case of a problem. But the whole point is that we're going to relate the movement to this. Okay, and you see we we pay the log k here. So now all I have to do, again, as always, is to relate the movement to the service cost, which is just the amount of missing mass at location R. So all I want to say is that when the missing mass at location R gets small, I'm moving also more slowly. Okay. Which, which makes sense. It's like when, when there is a lot of mass in a location, it, it should mean uh, I should be more reluctant to remove the mass from there. Because if there was a lot of mass there, it's probably that it was important. Maybe it was requested very recently in the past. Or maybe it's very far away in the metric space. And you know, this is not a, I, I already traveled that far. I don't want to move out of there. Okay, so this is what, what we have to do. So let's just do it. But it's, I mean, we're going to do it for the, for the fun of it. But it's exactly the same as uh, for metrical task systems. Yes? What is the effect of the fact that you took the cost to be a constant without changing? So what would have happened if you did a different cost function? Yeah, it doesn't matter because so if you... Scale, yeah, it, if, you, if you want, it's like choosing a different <coughs> learning rate. I mean, what you will see, if you choose a different cost, then there will be a bigger constant here, 
But then in relating the movement to this, there will be one over that constant. Okay. So things are, will just cancel out. Okay, so what is the dynamics? So let me write the dynamics. So the dynamics, again, uh, it's the time derivative of x is minus the inverse Hessian of phi at x applied to this cost plus lambda t. Okay, and what is lambda t? For, for us now, lambda t is going to be, I will have one constraint, so it's going to be the sum of new i of t times e i for i equals 1 to n. So this is non-negative and strictly positive uh, implies that uh, uh, strictly positive implies that x i is equal to 1. And there will be one term for the, for the Lagrangian constraint uh, which is going to be say plus uh, mu t times all 1. Okay, this ensures that the total mass remains constant. And this is just ER. Okay, so when you write it, what do you get? You get that x, the time derivative at x, at location i, so the speed at which the missing mass is changing, this is what? Uh, so this Hessian inverse <coughs> is just... Uh, inverse wi 1 over wi, it's just xi of t over wi times, here we have the indicator, so with a minus, we have the indicator that i is equal to r, so if I'm at location r, I push down, otherwise I don't have this push, and then we get plus uh, new i of t, and maybe let me write it with a minus here, minus mu t. Okay, so as always, we see that mu t has to be non-negative. Okay, because I'm pushing down here, this is just making stuff stop. So the only way that the total mass is, is going to be preserved is if this is non-negative. Okay, so we see that the only uh, non negative the, the negative part of this is just going to be uh, so it's zero for i not equal to r and for i equal to r it's just minus uh, it's it's smaller it's bigger than minus xi of t over wi for i equals to r Okay, so all the locations are increasing except the requested location. That's what this is saying. So all the locations are increasing, so they don't have a negative movement. The only location which has a negative movement is a requested location, and its negative movement is uh, not faster than minus xi over wi. Okay, so what is the negative movement, the time derivative of the negative movement? This is upper bounded by just, you know, the sum uh, of wi times the absolute value of dt xit uh, negative part, okay, which is at most <coughs> x r of t. So the negative movement is exactly this virtual service cost, which is, we just said, bounded by log k times mt star. Okay, so you get that this is log k competitive. This is a, this is a complete proof. I, I didn't cheat anywhere. Yeah. Just to clarify. Uh, okay, is there any question on this before I write something for, for trees? What do you get the movement This thing? Uh, this is by definition. Uh, the oh, this one, this one just here. This is a general mirror descent statement. Yeah, 
uh, it's just like, you know, when I explained what was the Wasserstein norm, I explained that you can take any reference measure and then look at from this reference measure, if you want to do a small perturbation, how much does it cost? The, the background in which you're making this movement doesn't matter. And it's the same thing here. You know, the starting configuration doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, so let me, uh, let's see. Yeah, let me conclude with just some ideas for the tree case. So I'm just going to talk about the, uh, the polytope that we need for the tree case. OK, so five, allocation, polytope for trees. So you remember in metrical task system, one of the key on trees was this, this idea to expand the state space and that allowed us to, uh, to track the movement much nicer. So for MTS, we looked at the following. So K was the set of X in R plus uh, V, such that we just had that the root at the mass one and for any u in v uh, minus the leaf, x u has to be, so the sum of the children has to be at least x u. Right, and, and we explained that this uh, formulation of adding those variables allowed us to use uh, a, regular, a regularizer, right, a mirror map phi, which, which had a diagonal action. Okay, so then the inversion is much easier and you can just say you invert the Hessian, and it's a diagonal and you just have to deal with the Lagrangian term and to deal with the Lagrangian term we had this uh, weighted depth potential. So this was for MTS. So now, what about K-server? So let's think in terms of Z uh, for the moment. So think in terms of Z. So we have ZL for, for leaf L. It's very natural to have that Z, ZL is just again the probability that there exists a server at location L. Okay, this is just the same interpretation as the one we have been using so far. What would be a natural inner variable for the inner node? So if you start to do something like this, if you start to summing stuff up, you don't get the probability interpretation anymore. You get you know, the expected number of servers in that subtree. But eventually we want to use an entropy functional. So an entropy functional, you know, for it to type check, you have to put probabilities in it. You cannot put you know, numbers which uh, go up to k. So you have to put probabilities in it. And uh, thankfully, to guide us, there is this previous paper that I already cited, Ben Sal, Binder, Madri, and Nao, which were looking at what's called the allocation problem and allocation variables. And what those variables are, are the following. I will write them and then write what the polytope is, and that, that would be it. So, here are the allocation variables. So at the leaf, it's just the probability that there exists a server at location L. Higher up, we're going to look at the, for node U in V, we're going to look at the probability that there exists at least I servers in subtree U. Right? Because in a subtree, there could be one server, there could be two servers, there could be three servers. So we will need, we will keep track, these are the allocation variables, keeping track of how many servers you have. Okay. This is a CDF. And I'm just going to define Z at location U and for an integer I to be this thing. 
and we're going to run mirror descent on x ui which is 1 minus z ui so we will run we run mirror descent on the set of variable x ui which is a variable 1 minus z ui but now I need to tell you what are the constraints that I put on this ZUI. Okay, before we just had, in MTS, we just had that the mass uh, had to be increasing when you go down the tree. So now what are the variables? What you have to realize is, you know, I could write a bunch of inequalities that specify that this is a consistent probability distribution, that there is really a probabilistic interpretation that gives us that. But any constraint that you put, it induces movement. And the constraints that we want to put, we definitely want to put them only along edges so that we can say the corresponding Lagrangian term is going to induce movement on that edge. Okay, so we want to have those local constraints. So here is the type of constraints that we have. We certainly know that the probability that there is a server in, uh, in the subtree U, that has to be bigger than the probability that there is uh, at least J server in any of its ch child V. So for any uh, V such that uh, PV is equal to U and J is bigger than 1. Okay, we, we certainly know that. And that's kind of a fine constraint. It's okay to put this constraint because this is a local, a local constraint between that node and that node. So it's going to induce a Lagrangian term which makes appear some movement here. And that's fine. That's the kind of things we can control. But we also know, what about ZU2? So you know, you would like to say ZU2 is smaller than ZU1. You know, certainly the probability that there exist at least two services at location in subtree U is smaller than the probability that there exists at least one. We don't want that. Okay. This type of constraint, what does it mean? You know, this is all about one node. We cannot account it for movement on that one node. So instead, we replace this by ZU1, what do we know? We know that ZU1 plus ZU2 has to be bigger than ZVJ plus ZV prime J prime. For any VJ, V prime J prime, which are child. Yes? Can you read why we don't want that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not a great explanation. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, we don't want that because constraints like this, they are going to introduce a Lagrangian term. This Lagrangian term, it induces movement that we will have to explain somehow. But how are you going to explain movement that you know, comes from this node and stays at this node? What does it mean? You see? Whereas if you relate this node and that node, then the Lagrangian term, I understand what it's doing. It's moving mass from here to there. It's using this edge, and I know how to measure this distance. So, so, the, yeah. so the allocation polytope is going to be that for any S, for any set S of the form uh, V1, J1, V, uh, S, JS, for any set of this form, we're going to want that the sum for I equals 1 to N of the z u uh, for i equals one to the size of s of the z u i is at least the sum over all v j in s of z v j, and we're going to put in our polytope all of those constraints, and this is what we call the allocation polytope. Okay, so the allocation polytope it's 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 written in terms of the x variables, but in terms of the z variable. It's all the, all the vectors z, which are defined z ui. So for any vertex u, I have like an infinite size uh, uh, bucket, if you want. So any, any integer i. And what I want is that uh, for any set s of this form, the sum of the z ui is at least the sum of the z vj. And you have z at the root. At the root, it's of the following form. What's the probability that I have at least one server in the problem? It's one. What's the probability that I have at least two servers in the problem? It's one. Okay, so it's one up to k, and then it's zeros. 
Okay, so at the root, z, the bucket for z, it looks like 1, 1, 1, k times, and then only zeros. And down the tree, you have those constraints. And then on top of it, you run mirror descent with the multiscale entropy. And trust me, it's, the proof is exactly the same as for metrical task system. The only difference, the only thing which you have to show is that you, you keep a real, uh, uh, you know, measure that the, the server mass remains n minus k. And, and this you do, you use the fact that you have all of those constraints. This is where you use that, the fact that you have all of those constraints. But in terms of the movement, the analysis is exactly the same, you know. All of those constraints are going to introduce some lambda hat s which is some movement in a movement between the top node and the bottom node. And this, this gives you d times log k analysis. And in fact, we can get log squared k. Okay, so we can get log k times log k. And I will conclude with that. The reason is because this, this depth is kind of arbitrary. If you think about k server and this, then we enter an entirely new field with many, many questions, uh, which is the following. You have this huge state space of size n. But you know, all the requests, they are maybe in a certain part of the space. Everything is happening here. So really you want to depend on k, not on n. And the way we do that is we say, instead of having a depth du, we replace this depth by some function d of z. So we, we assign a depth which depends on really how much mass is there in that part of the tree. So part of the tree where there are no mass, they don't matter. And they shouldn't matter. So we replace du by some function of z. And that gives us log k instead of d. That's the state of the art. Any improvement would be great. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you.